Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people just like you who are doing great things in the world. Today, we have a very special guest all the way from Australia. If you remember recently, I had a wonderful doctor named Dr. Greg Fitzgerald on, and this is where I heard of the next doctor was from his presentation. And you guys love Dr. Fitzgerald's accent so much, you wanted him back. He is coming back. But in the meantime, I have a new special guest, and his name is Dr. Malcolm Mackay. And you're going to hear his story, how how, how he became one of the only plant-based doctors in Australia. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Malcolm Mackay. Thank you so much for being here. I know it's very early where you are. Good morning, AJ. Uh, it's an honor to be on your program. Thank you. Well, thank you. It is so nice meeting you, and I can't wait to hear about how your journey evolved, especially in a, in a country that is not as well-known, perhaps, for plant-based living. Yes, well, my journey actually uh, goes back a very long way. I'm, I'm, I'm older than I look. Um, in medical school, who, um, a cardiology lecture, um, they told us about um, what they call the inevitable process of atherosclerosis, where all of us, as we get older, would get this terrible disease in our arteries. And the lecturer showed us pictures of stroked out brains and damaged hearts. And that was pretty gruesome for a year old in medical school. And yeah, there were risk factors, but he did call it the inevitable process of, you know, atherosclerosis, artery disease. But then fortuitously in the same semester, another lecturer told us about that there are peoples in the world, like the peoples of uh, highland Papua New Guinea, who live on sweet potatoes, and that's it, who never got artery disease. Whatever they died of eventually, they never got any artery disease. And for me, um, I'm one to think things through, and I put two and two together and thought, hang, hang on, hang on, whoa, whoa, this is our number one killer. Maybe we don't have to get it at all. Um, so I, I, at the time, I, I was, uh, you know, starting to do more distance running that I had done at school, but I was sort of starting to get back into it as a 20-year-old. And so I thought, hey, um, um, this could help me to have good archery flow. And besides which, I love snow skiing, and I want to keep doing it as I get older. And so I was in, and so uh, um, I, I tried to sort of simulate the sort of uh, low fat, you know, no salt, sort of unprocessed plant-based diet of these peoples of, you know, of rural Africa, China, New Guinea. And it seemed to work for me. Um, you know, within the next year, um, I ran a 232 marathon. I won one of the very early triathlons in Australia. Um, and then I, I went on from there and I think all my classmates thought I was crazy. And uh, a, a year or two later, I actually found um, Nathan Pritikin's books and realized I wasn't crazy. After all, that there are lots of other people who just had a look at the medical literature and it was like, okay, well, this is pretty obvious. I don't know why more doctors don't pick this up. It's, you know, there's just so much published research going back so far. Um, I went on from there. I went into medical tests. Um, a few years later, I realized, I thought to myself, you know, I sort of have, a, have an intuitive idea about nutrition and low fat, low salt, et cetera, you know, approach, but I don't really have any basic education in nutrition. And doctors in Australia still get very little nutrition training in medical school. And so I went back to university as, uh, and, uh, uh, for eight semesters and did a graduate diploma in human nutrition, um, which gave me a better understanding. It gave me a better understanding of why conventional nutrition sort of looks at the science. It sort of would push us towards what, what we would think was a good idea and then takes it in another direction. Um, yeah, I think over the years in my medical practice, you know, I sort of probably got a little bit burnt out because I was at, um, not that I ever stopped giving patients advice or not that I ever stopped doing a 99% plant-based, you know, um, uh, no oil diet. Um, but people would often only just make small changes. And, you know, on an individual, on a population level, a small change across the population sort of makes a difference. But on an individual level, you know, their diabetes doesn't quite go away. They don't quite get there. The few that did, did really well you know, heart disease, um, et cetera. Um, and then it was many, many years later, I sort of reconnected, like uh, back in about, actually back in 2008, I was a divorcee. I was skiing with my sister and um, she introduced me to this lady on the chairlift, which is Jenny Cameron, who's sort of, uh, we're now like team Malcolm and Jenny. And um, 
um, I think connected with the US movement, you know, when, when it was all sort of coming together, I think because of Forks Over Knives um, documentary coming out. And uh, in 2013, I went to the first um, Plantrition Project conference in Florida. I, I looked at the conference and thought, oh, I wish I could go, but I can't go all the way to Florida from Melbourne. And then our air, national airline had a super special to Dallas. And so I was off to this conference. And uh, um, look, uh, I've continued to go back to the Plantrition Project conference every year. And it's such an inspiration, not just all the fabulous speakers at that four day conference, but just to be in a room with a thousand other delegates, mostly doctors, and to be interacting and talking about all the projects and all the things we're doing and how we're thinking about it is so inspiring. And I guess that led my partner, Jenny and I, to um, start doing more here to build our own website, which I think you'll link to in the show notes, and um, to start doing some half-day seminars, which became one-day seminars. And now in our state of lockdown, we've now put it into a webinar series. And we've run about, um, the last few years, about um, eight uh, live-in events where we are uh, we have an immersion event where people come and live uh, in a um, resort on a on a seaside resort in Victoria, on the Surf Coast, and, and um, stay with us for six days. And Jenny and I give lectures and talks. Um, and we have another lady who has a vegan cafe right next door to the resort, and she does um, all of catering. And uh, we see some amazing results. At that in that short period of time and that six days. And, and I think we see some amazing results because of the very high level of adherence. Even people who've previously been on a, on a vegan diet or a fairly healthy diet, you know, we get cases where their joint pain goes away, for example. Um, they look healthier and feel healthier by the end of the week. Um, I, I should add that um, several years ago, you know, the lifestyle medicine uh, movement has been taking off across the world. So doctors are recognizing that, that you know, we're treating chronic disease caused by lifestyle. We need to pay attention to the lifestyle, including all the domains, um, uh, like it, not just nutrition, although I always regard nutrition as the keystone to healthy lifestyle. Um, so um, I took um, um, the core competencies in lifestyle medicine course that's offered through the US and uh, and, and then uh, became a board certified lifestyle medicine practitioner and a fellow of the uh, Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, and that sort of took me back to where I started because when I started my journey, it wasn't just nutrition, it was also about you know, trying to manage my excessive stress and do more exercise and things. And so that's where I am in uh, 2020 in our beautiful city of Melbourne, 5 million people, um, we almost had COVID under control in Australia, very few cases until this huge surge of cases in a second wave in uh, Melbourne. And so they've uh, put us back into lockdown. We have to wear a mask to go outside and we're only allowed to go out to do an hour's deck either or one person go shopping or uh, essential occupations can go to work. And uh, that's where we are at the moment uh, down under in Melbourne. The rest of Australia is faring better. Um, there are some states in Australia um, where it's sort of uh, pretty much the business as usual. That's incredible. You know, people are commenting like Susan that it's interesting that Australia offers little medical school uh, nutritional information, same as in the United States. And your immersion program sounds amazing. Can anybody come to it? Um, yes, yes. Yeah, we only, we have, uh, we limit numbers to about about 15 people because um, the actual group interaction is very important and we're only really set up to you know manage a small number of people it's sort of like uh, Jenny and I run the whole show it's sort of exhausting we're just sort of there from uh, early morning to late at night uh, we provide all the um, lecture content um, and and organize um, we have people come in and do some uh, yoga and meditation. And, and uh, Anita, our other partner in it, um, she does the catering and the cooking demonstrations. Yeah, yeah, no, any, anyone can, uh, can enroll. And uh, yeah, if someone wanted to come out sometime from the US and make it part of their Australian okay. holiday, mm -hmm. uh, we, hold, we hold it in a beautiful area oh, of your Australia. Your sound called? is breaking Earth. up. Can you guys hear him? Oh. Um, All the way yes. out. You said if somebody if somebody wants to come by, 
um, they can register on our website. At the moment, we've had to um, stop doing, we, we just got in an immersion in February. We'd normally run four per year, um, but so far this year we've, we've had to cancel them all. We've possibly got one in early December, but it, it's really in a lot of doubt. Um, yeah, so if anyone from the US or anyone in Australia would listen to this would like to uh, attend our immersion event, uh, we'd love to have them. I think that's so interesting that you found Pritikin's books. I love, I loved his work. If I, I wish he was alive, I would love to interview him. Yes, we back in um, the late 19 to late 1980s, we actually had a very active Pritikin Health Association in Australia. Um, I became president of the South Australian branch because I was living in Adelaide and we'd have monthly meetings and uh, uh, sometimes I'd speak, sometimes we'd have a guest speaker. And uh, at one point in, in my medical training, I, I did an elective in the USA. I made sure that um, I, I actually asked the Pretty Center whether I could intern there. And that was sort of going commercial at that stage. And they said, no, no, but you can come and do a day visit, which I did. That's neat. And it's interesting how you said that on an individual level, small changes don't always facilitate the health outcomes that people are looking for. Well, that's right. And uh, I think that's often where, when, when we're talking about lifestyle medicine and, and uh, you know, improving people's health with nutrition, uh, often, well, in Australia, it's often sort of the academic sort of public health people that become involved. And I think unless you're a practitioner and experienced in, in this um, area of actually treating people, um, they, don't, they often don't realize that on an individual level, you know, um, sort of three quarters that still having a little bit of meat, a little bit of oil might be a total fail if that person has another cardiac event or, or their disease or their or rheumatoid arthritis joints remain swollen and painful then it's sort of like it's a complete fail. Uh, and it, it is, it, it, I think what I've learned through both sharing the experience of uh, other practitioners and my own experience in practice and at the immersions is that you often need to have a very high level of adherence to, uh, particularly if you're trying to reverse established disease to, to really get excellent results. I agree with you because I work with people that are trying to lose weight and I love that word adherence because it doesn't sound so, I don't know, there's something nice about it. It doesn't, it just like, it, do you know what I mean? It's, it's not a, a, it's not a negative word. It's just like, they, they no, we've, we've, we, we've, I remember we had one of our friends attended our immersion and, uh, and reminded us, oh, no, no, words like compliance. You can't use words like compliance. And we, we sort of all these sort of should type words. And yes, yeah, so we came across adherent. Yeah. It, it, but it's true because like people don't think about being overweight or obese as a disease. And once you have a lifestyle disease, it does take more adherence to reverse it than perhaps just to prevent it. Yeah, it's sort of like um, if you draw an analogy to climate change, you know, <laughs> If we if we'd started doing something very early, uh, it'd be much easier. But you know, once things have gone past the tipping point, you know, once the Arctic ice melts and it's now absorbing more sunlight and the methane's coming out of the tundra, etc., then you have to do a lot to try and reverse it. And yeah, it's just the human body sort of a complex uh, um, um, complex situation too. And, and yeah, you're right. You you need a very much higher level of uh, of effort and adherence to actually, you know, treat something once it's gone past the tipping point. And, and I think that it's interesting applying tipping points to disease. Like we've probably all got a few autoimmune antibodies, but boy, once it really goes past the tipping point into, you know, lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, um, yeah, treatment's a lot harder than prevention. Yeah, especially with things like cancer. Well, sometimes, you know, the, the tipping point's gone. I um, mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident to say to people that nutrition regulates cancer, but uh, um, once the tipping point's gone well past and the cancer's evolved, um, yeah, it's not always possible to stop it completely. That's very convenient that you have a vegan restaurant next to your retreat. Are there many vegan restaurants in Australia? 
Um, yes, here in Melbourne, we're, we're, we would be the vegan restaurant, vegan capital of Australia. And uh, where my practice is in sort of inner Melbourne is, is sort of like ground zero for the, uh, the vegan restaurants. There are dozens and dozens of them, uh, virtually none of them that we can eat at because um, you know it's all oil, 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 and you know like our rich foods and nut products and uh, and and you know processed foods. So it's actually pretty hard to find a vegan restaurant. In fact, sometimes it's almost easier to go to a, a non-vegan restaurant because sometimes a vegan restaurant sort of feels like they've already they've already reached perfection. It's vegan and it's organic oil, and. Uh, Whereas, you know, if you're at a Thai restaurant or something, hey, it might be white rice, but, you know, they may be willing to sort of stir fry the vegetables without oil. Yeah. Eating is one of the most difficult parts about following a whole foods plant-based diet in Australia. I think it's difficult here, Dr. Mackay, too, because I agree with you that sometimes you can get a healthier vegan meal, like at a steakhouse where they have baked potatoes and all kinds of vegetables than at a vegan restaurant when everything's already put together with all the sugar, oil, and salt. So I'm, I'm there with you. Here's a great question from Apple, who's watching live. She says, does Dr. Mackay get a lot of resistance to changing eating habits, or are your patients already ready to try something new? That's a really great question. And, um, you know, I've sort of given a talk before to a group of practitioners on that. Um, from the people in the, in the whole food plant-based movement sort of may think, you know, that the doctor says, you know how you've got overweight and PCOS and you've got all that acne. Um, you know, you could just, if you, we could take a dietary approach and, and that would get better. And you would think the doctor would go, the patient would say, oh, thank you, doctor. I'm really glad that doctors talked about nutrition. Um, no, you have to be really sensitive introducing this because, you know, um, you know, if you just get it subtly wrong, this will feel you blaming them. Or I think I even had someone who almost thumped the table. I've had many men who've given me steely glares when I've said to them, you know how you take the cholesterol tablet? Well, you know, uh, you, it wouldn't make sense to um, be eating the food that's going to increase your cholesterol, like the uh, chicken and the fish and the meat and the eggs and dairy. Uh, whereas you could eat more food like, um, um, you know, beans and whole grains and vegetables, and that would actually decrease it. And they just stare, give me a, sometimes give me a steely stare or into the sky and, and sort of repeat like a mantra, my mother had high cholesterol, my mother had high cholesterol. So I think it's sort of like, um, uh, I feel like as a practitioner, and I've studied lifestyle medicine, so I'm, I'm aware of the issues of, you know, ready, stages of readiness for change. Is, and so nowadays I'm quite happy to just write on the note, not ready for nutrition change. But then um, I'll come back to that. Um, so it's sort of like I'm dangling the bait. I'm dangling the bait. I'm, I'm casting, um, I'm planting the seed. And... So then uh, on the run, uh, you know, from as I'm talking to the patient, I then need to do an assessment. Are they open to this? Are they really open to this? Are they interested? Are they actually angry that I've raised you of nutrition because they immediately have some guilt problem, no matter how non-personally directed you make it? So it's actually quite challenging to raise the issue with a patient that nutrition might actually help their condition to get better and they might not need all those medications. Um, but... I think that um, it's almost be unethical for me to prescribe someone a cholesterol tablet without telling them this, an acne medicine in a um, you know a thirty year old adult without telling them. Uh, it would be unethical for me to prescribe an erection tablet without telling them about the foods that at work or stop at work. Um, so I sort of feel obliged to do that in a sort of non-judgmental sort of way, and then I dangle the bait. And if they take the bait, I'll take it further and maybe give them a resource to go and look at um, but uh, and then, but then I might just have to drop it and you get surprises though um, like I've had patients who have actually made a note in their file um, not open to not ready for dietary change which was a really nice way in the record to write um, she seemed to look he seemed to look really angry when I just mentioned nutrition and then maybe you see the person six months later and they say oh doctor what sort of plant milk would you recommend and this is Stop and go, oh, you know, I've been the other person who sort of wasn't interested or happy at all. So, you know, I, I think we should all sort of always sort of be prepared to plant that seed, to dangle that bait, 
to to take it at the pace or where the patient wants to go at the time because you never know you know that same man who gave you the steely glare uh, uh, and and chanted the, the cholesterol because his mother had high cholesterol he may meet a vegan girlfriend or have a niece who goes vegan or, or, or son or daughter and come back to you one day and say, you know what, I'm not doing too well. Uh, and my daughter or someone's told me that maybe if I change my diet, things can be better. So you never know when the seed will grow. Yeah, that's great. So some people are coming to you not realizing you are a plant-based doctor then. Uh, I think most of my doc patients don't realize I'm a plant-based doctor. And uh, where they sit beside my desk, they often look up at my bookshelf and sometimes look puzzled at titles like How Not to Die on the bookshelf. Um, so a lot of my patients are not, most of them are not seeing me as a plant-based doctor. Um, I, I see a lot of patients who uh, come to see me because I'm a, a vegan doctor and I actually identify myself as whole food plant-based rather than vegan. Although that, you know, obviously I'm eating a vegan diet essentially um, because they want to see a doctor who's going to be positive and supportive and not tell them to go and eat meat and dairy. And then they find they've seen one who's sort of encouraging them to eat a healthier vegan diet. Um, and then I think over the last couple of years, I'm seeing an increasing number of people who didn't start off as vegan, but who have uh, health conditions um, and have somehow found out, found out about it, about whole foods, plant-based and the benefits it can have and are then coming to see me for guidance or for help in uh, managing their medical condition, you know, um, uh, as like the transition. Because of course, you know, if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, some other conditions, um, you know, you, um, you, it can be a problem to suddenly change your diet because you, your body gets better so quickly that the that doctor might, with medical um, support, you might need to rapidly reduce to de-prescribe your medications. And uh, we've seen a couple of people at our living immersion events there um, on insulin for type two diabetes. And, you know, on day, I remember one person, you know, on day three, he'd already rapidly reduced his insulin. On, on day three, he's having a little bit of a hypo at morning yoga and, and um, sort of, you know, um, I think you should have a piece of bread or a snack there and we'll have to reduce it further. Um, and I guess that, that's one of our roles as doctors when people make a, a rapid dietary transition is to help them to uh, manage their uh, medications to de-prescribe them. And, and I guess that takes me back to my position that uh, as a medical doctor, it's not all or none. You know, if, if you're doing, it's not either you do whole foods, plant-based nutrition or you do medical treatment. Um, there'd be plenty of conditions, you know, while you've still got um, blood pressure that's much too high, I'll still keep you on a blood pressure tablet. Uh, I'll only reduce those drugs as your pressures uh, improve. Yeah. So we have Tiffany who's watching live from Melbourne, but she says she's not in the 5K radius where we're allowed to travel. Do you do telehealth appointments? Look, I, I do provide telehealth and I've been doing this for several years and I use Zoom meetings like we're doing now. And uh, the, the way our licensing works in Australia, I'm actually licensed to see someone who resides or is at the time anywhere in Australia. Um, and I can do prescriptions and send pathology requests. Um, and the government um, brought in uh, a telehealth, um, you know, Medicare rebate for telehealth. And then a few weeks ago, they tightened it up again. Um, so I've been doing privately billed um, telehealth in Australia for several years. But since late March, or, or under the latest scheme, um, I actually, um, I can charge Medicare for anyone doing telehealth who lives in a level three lockdown area, which is currently the whole of Victoria. Um, for other parts of Australia, the, the, the Medicare rebate doesn't apply and then there's just a small fee. So if she's, with the, if she's in Melbourne, um, sure, she can do a telehealth with me. Actually, I think if she's in Melbourne, I think you can breach the uh, five kilometer travel rule um, for a medical appointment. That's fantastic. Linda, who's watching live, wants to know if you know Philip Wallen. I, I know Philip. I, I don't know Philip Wallen 
personally, um, but I've certainly attended presentations by uh, Philip, Wall <laughs> Philip Wallen. And uh, no, no, he's done some amazing things. Um, you know, he, he's funded, uh, uh, um, you know, the sort of vegan health environmental movement here in Australia uh, and uh, uh, has influenced so many people. Yeah, we're, we're, happy, we're glad to uh, have Philip Warren while in Melbourne. All right, Linda, see if you can get him on the show. We'd love to talk to him. So Laurel wants to, more information about the stay and the lectures. Oh, at our motion event. Yeah, um, we've, we obviously, we give a lot of lectures where, you know, we'll talk about what, the why, you know, all the evidence for whole foods, plant-based nutrition. Um, I, I like to also get into the sort of mechanisms of disease, talking about, you know, what, what causes insulin resistance, uh, you know, um, uh, talk about the, the sort of mechanisms behind artery disease. Um, but we take it beyond just the, it's more than just like reading a book because um, we then go into the, the, the how, uh, what is a whole foods plant-based diet? And my partner, Jenny Cameron, gives some fantastic presentations, um, including um, one on um, um, uh, um, calorie density, for example. Um, so we try and sort of set them up with all that sort of practical knowledge and then and then we sort of take it to, uh, and and we have some cooking demonstrations and we even go and do a supermarket tour at the local supermarket um, after Jenny's done a label reading session. Um, but because it's sort of a long enough event and there's time to go sort of beyond the fit nutrition, um, we also bring in some other healthy lifestyle things. Like we either have a walk on the local beach or a yoga session every morning. Um, I give some talks on um, on the other um, domains of healthy lifestyle, like you know sleep and mental health and uh, and stress management, um, and um, I lost my train of thought there. About um, the immersion. Yeah, and we also we all haven't lost it that badly. I'm only sixty one, um, and um, uh, we also look at. Um, barriers to change and we look at the psychology like we, we uh we, we often we use some of the material of uh from doug lyle um you know like for example he's got that cram circuit video online um so we very much we spend some sessions where we talk to people about you know dealing with others um dealing with craving um the cram circuit as doug lyle calls it um you know the the pleasure trap so we try and sort of set people up we try and make it not just it's not like one of these retreats where you come into a healthy retreat for the week and then you go home to what you're doing we try and, and uh, um, provide people with all the tools they need so that when they go back home when they go back to the community that they're prepared for the um for the difficulties and the barriers they might face. And as a group, we even do some group exercises where we have little breakout sessions where the group breaks into, you know, threes or fours and actually discuss things like uh, barriers to, you know, dietary change, dealing with other people or, or how to, you know, um, bring physical activity into their lives. Yeah, I think dealing with other people is probably the most challenging part of adopting a whole food plant-based diet. You mentioned Dr. Lyle, who is a regular at least once a month on this show and a very dear friend of mine. You know, he recently spoke at Australia. Did you see him? No, I didn't. We were surprised. We, we read somewhere that he was speaking in Canberra. Um, yeah. We wondered what he was doing here, but uh, we'd all, we'd be very happy to have Dr. Doug Lyle. Um, and, uh, uh, we've got a group in Australia that's sort of um, similar to the Plantrition Project called Doctors for Nutrition. It's a fairly new organisation that we're still winding up and getting it going. I, I, I'm sort of I, I'm, I'm one of the one of the people that's sort of supporting and encouraging it. And uh, they had a conference in March of last year um, and um, had had some excellent um, guest speakers come out from the US and maybe Doug Lyle could be on our circuit, you know, to speak at a future DFN conference. If the conference, assuming the conference is on next March, uh, they've secured Dean and Aisha Shirzai as speakers. 
that'll be in Melbourne next March if we're allowed to have a conference, which is pretty much in doubt. That would be amazing. You know, a lot of people are doing them virtually now, like the Plantrition Project. I'm attending the Virtual Plantrition Project Conference. We were going to our dietitian, we were going to go to our dietitian friend's house for two weekends and sort of watch a video and have a group discussion. And uh, but we're all locked down in Melbourne now, but we think that we'll probably do the same thing. We'll watch the virtual conference in our home and then have a virtual Zoom meeting with our, our friends who have also watched it, sort of to sort of uh, be like the delegates chatting at the table between presentations. That sounds fantastic. How long uh, have you been? Um, oh, um, yeah, it's like everything is becoming virtual, isn't it? Um, I, I even uh, I ran a virtual half marathon a couple of weeks ago. That's amazing. How long have you and Jenny been plant based? Well, when I met Jenny, 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 I, I was living in Adelaide, and Jenny was here in Melbourne, and and uh, uh, Jenny would would uh, would yeah, it was the only thing I met Jenny on the chairlift, uh, sort of. Uh, she, and I met her a couple more times that season at, at our favourite ski resort. And then she ticked all the boxes um, for, you know, a jaded divorcee like me. And um, But she lived in a different city. That was like, didn't quite tick that box. And so we'd meet up every two couple of weeks. And Jenny would go Adelaide and sort of, you know, eat Malcolm's food, which I wouldn't do now. Um, and, and so she'd come eat my food and then she'd go back home to Melbourne. Um, so that was 2008. By the time I moved to Melbourne, and oh, Jenny then I read the China study. By the time I moved to Melbourne in 2012 to live with Jenny full time, um, we're almost completely off that tiny bit of fish flavoring. And um, um, yeah, I, I guess, at that point, yeah, we're well, fully whole foods plant-based. So for me, I've been 99% whole foods plant-based um, since I was, uh, you know, 21. And for Jenny, she's uh, been uh, whole foods plant-based uh, since soon after she met me in 2008. You mentioned that she had read the China study. That seems to be a, a, one of the books that has uh, transitioned so many people, especially medical professionals. Was there a certain book you read or a certain speaker you heard that clinched it for you? Um, yeah, I think having seen that, those lectures um, at medical school, uh, I think it was within the next year I found the uh, Pritikin program as I wasn't as crazy as my classmates thought I was. So Nathan Pritikin really did it for me. Yeah. I think with Jenny, it was interesting because she was a little bit rattled about breast cancer risk. And on one of her visits to visit me in Adelaide, um, I flipped open the China study to this uh, graph of uh, breast cancer versus fat consumption across the world. And um, she went home and Jenny was working as a university librarian and she got the book out of her library and realized that she'd actually ordered the book for the School of Health Sciences without knowing it. And she said, once she finished chapter three, she understood uh, and stopped eating dairy. That's fantastic. Do you have any plant-based heroes that are United States doctors or? Oh, oh, very much, very much a fan of Dr. John McDougall. Um, we've done several adventure holidays with uh, John and Mary McDougall. Um, so yeah, yeah, very much fans of of, uh, of the McDougals. Um, Jenny has actually taken her mother to uh, a fast at True North, and we've met Alan Goldhammer on on, uh, on several occasions. So I'm a, certainly a, a fan of uh, Dr. Goldhammer. I've never met Doug Lyle in, in person, but I'm a fan of Doug Lyle. And of course, oh, and, and um, I've had the privilege of. Uh, meeting several times and even uh, chatting with um, um, uh, uh, Dr. T. Colin Campbell. Uh, and um, yeah, so there's some of my fans uh, in the US. Uh, and, and if you look at my photo collection, some of our presentations, we have all these celebrity photos of us. Uh, and, and Michael Clapper, I've got to know Dr. Clapper quite well and he's been out to Melbourne and uh, I've always got time, had, We've always had time um, to spend with uh, Michael and uh, Elise Clapper. Fantastic man. 
Well, you, you mentioned all my favorites. Sandy, who's watching live, wants to know, is there such a thing as a healthy whole food plant-based meal replacement? I'm referring to powdered replacements. Uh, no, because I think as soon as it's a powder, it's not really um, whole foods plant-based anymore. All right. Thank you. Great answer. So I, I imagine Jenny's a pretty good uh, cook. Yeah, um, Jenny is. When I met Jenny, you know, I thought what I was had. You know, I'd mix all the vegetables together in a big bowl and maybe add in a few beans or tofu and all sorts of spices. And, uh, and I'd cook it up I'd cook in the microwave in one big bowl. I'd call it vegetables or microwaves is what I've said. Jenny's called it vegetable slop. And then I'd do another pot where I'd just do a big, big pot of brown rice or wholemeal pasta. And, you know, I thought I was doing all right. And then I met Jenny and um, the, the uh, evening meals took a lot longer to prepare, but they're a lot more um, sophisticated and, and more delicious. Um, however, we're not really the recipe people. You know, we sort of like, sub, you know, all the work we do in whole foods, plant-based nutrition, although we do, Kate, when we were able to do uh, a one-day seminar for, you know, um, 15 to 20 people, it was really hard work. We do all the catering. Um, but like when we, we sort of um, uh, subcontract out, if you like, refer people to other ex more expert people for recipes. And when we do our live-in immersion event, um, uh, Anita Ricky is our um, cooking and uh, and uh, recipe expert. Uh, well, uh, Laurel says I should have Jenny to cook on the show, and I did ask Laurel, but as Dr. Mackay said, they're not recipe people, and I really like that about you because I had Chef Bravo on yesterday from True North, and he was saying the same thing. People always want recipes and exact measurements, but I'm more for just people eating the food. Yeah, and the way we cook... Um, 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 oh, and I have to give you some praise. Thank you very much for the um, uh, banana uh, oatmeal cookie that I had this morning before this um, interview. It was from your recipe, and they're delicious. And Jenny's now, Jenny now regularly makes this, and uh, the cookie monster in the house, which is me, just keeps eating them, and she has to keep making a new batch every week and freezing some. And um, and I really lost my train of thought there. Um, no, with the recipes, um, we're not really recipe people. Jenny's not really a recipe person. Um, we tend to use a pattern, like, you know, we have sort of different patterns of, of meals we make. Like I might cook the grain frica and make a Mediterranean dish, which means we'll have more garlic and, and herbs and maybe a few little diced olives in it. Um, or we might make a more Asian dish where we're having, or we'd cook brown rice and then we'd be cooking have some bean sprouts and some little bits of tofu in it and maybe a little bit of tiny bit of peanut paste in there. So we more have different patterns that we use. We might use a chickpea curry. We'd never, we don't use an exact recipe. Um, it's sort of, the sort of um, an approximation, you know, we're making a, um, you know, chili, chili peanut, you know, sort of a style meal. So that's sort of how, how we do our recipes as an approximation, depending what vegetables are in stock and what ingredients we've got and how we feel at the time. I agree with you. It's just, that's the best way. People keep saying, have Jenny on, have Jenny on. Maybe she could come on without cooking then and she could tell her story. I think if you had Jenny on, uh, Jenny, Jenny um, uh, comes from you know a, a university um, research support librarian background, so she's the one that's uh, able to put all the resources into our website and have all the research at her fingertips. And Jenny does some very good presentations on uh, calorie density and on the sort of idea of like what's the composition of your food, what's in your food, um, and, and sort of helping people to sort of understand. Um, um, the composition of food, the uncertainty of the composition of food, and how to use that to sort of put together um, sort of uh, a healthy sort of meal pattern. Yeah, that's the best. Do you have the, we, one thing that I really love in our country, and I, I don't know if you don't have them in your country, or I know our country often doesn't ship. Do you know, you ever heard of those reduced flavored balsamic vinegars? Um, <clears throat> yeah, like, like, uh, chocolate flavored and other flavored balsamic vinegars. 
Yeah, they don't always have to be oh. sweet, though. They can be savory as well, but they're really thick and delicious, and they just, they're just they almost like sauces. Do you have those in your country? Um, you know, we don't have nearly as many um, uh, products as you do over there. We have a much more limited range of products. Uh, we have this delicious dark balsamic vinegar um, that we buy. Uh, and, um, uh, for example, every morning before, we, before our giant bowl of um, uh, cooked oatmeal, um, we have some um, steamed kale with balsamic vinegar as a breakfast entree with, with our delicious dark balsamic vinegar on it. I love that you eat vegetables for breakfast, just like me. Now you're really my hero. You know the banana <laughs> cookies you had mentioned? You know what I do with them, Dr. Mackay? You, you've heard of making banana and ice cream, like with a Vitamix or a champion, mm. junior, right? Mm. So I make the cookies, I cool them, and then I make the banana ice cream and I put them between them and I just kind of roll the sides just in a little coconut so the ice cream doesn't slip out and I freeze them and then I have ice cream sandwiches. Oh, that sounds delicious. Yeah, I have a recipe, Actually, video. I'll send it to you. They're really quite good. And they last yes. forever because they're in the freezer. Great. And, and that sounds, that'd be something really nice to eat when we, uh, when we get our, um, w when summer returns. Um, this is a tough winter for us in Melbourne. We've, we've, it's quite a cold winter. And our, our winter for Jenny and I has a silver lining because uh, we're passionate snow skiers. Yes, we do have ski resorts here in Australia, here in Victoria. But, uh, um, the Victorian resorts are all closed. It's been a very bad season, so nature hasn't taunted us too much. Um, and it's sort of like endless winter with no snow skiing and lockdown. And uh, so when summer comes along, we'll look forward to the uh, uh, banana oatmeal cookies with, uh, with nice cream. Yeah. How long have you been such an avid exerciser? It really goes back to the beginning of my journey. I mean, uh, at school, I sort of, was hopeless at, at football and ball sports. And uh, I was so happy when I got to the middle of high school and I could do cross country running instead of football. Whereas other people in my class went, oh no, we have to run across country. Um, and, 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 and so I don't think I ever stopped from, from about age 12 onwards, that was sort of my interest, but I didn't always run all year long. I think by the time I finished high school, I, I'd never completely stopped doing a few runs a week and from about age, um, uh oh little voice little glitch i apologize guys you know it's australia it's really far away medical school uh oh uh, um, actually became quite a good runner. And by my mid twenties, I was actually a very good runner. Um, and you know, what, yeah, what uh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes I've sort of thought all the exercise I do, like I sometimes think, do I spend too much of my life? Kit, am I back on? You're on, but it's showing me, but, yeah, I, I, I but we run. can hear you again. Dr. Dr. Here. Here. Great, great. So, um, um, now that uh, um, uh, um, oh boy, your sound. Oh, this is the only. This is only. You know, I've done almost two hundred shows, and this is only the second time. Old, I've had some um, uh, I'm uh, not as fast a runner as I was forty years ago, but uh, you know, uh, um. Oh, I hope we can get him back. Oh, boy. Yeah, our, our internet's not as good as it should be here. Yeah, in, this is the only second. Melbourne. Oh, yeah, we had this once. Um, all right. So, so, yeah, yeah, no, it's almost easier. I'm not sure what to do. We're having such, uh, it was going so well for the first 45 minutes. Oh, what to do, what to do. Anybody here, a techie knows what to do. I don't think it's the Zoom. I think it's just Australia is quite far away. And uh, I know you- um, uh, I can, can you hear me now? I wonder if you log on and off- Let me know oh. when I'm back. It's, 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 we can hear you, but you're not showing up anymore. It's just me. And people are saying they cannot hear you very well. 
And I had one question. I'm on a different internet. Yeah. Am I back now? I think you're back. Yeah. Good. I've changed uh, changed from uh, um, the mobile to back to our, our national broadband, which sometimes. Um, yeah. No, I, I've kept up my physical activity. Um, I, I was. I was uh, I've, at times I got back into triathlon in my late forties and was sort of competitive in you know Olympic distance, but not Ironman. And with exercise, it's almost easier if you work out every morning because then there's no decision making. It's like it's just what I do when I get up in the morning. And um, um, as far as running goes, you know I, I can still do a pretty good fun run, a pretty good half marathon. I can go out running. And, uh, you know, I might have little, uh, runners will sometimes have little aches and pains, but my knees are still great. People say, what about your knees? No, my knees are just fine. I don't think I'd be able to run at a moderately fast pace um, and not have joint problems, etc. if I'd been eating, you know, chicken cheese and olive oil for the last 30 years. I very much attribute... Um, my enjoyment and ability to still, uh, for example, you know, run fairly well at age 61 to, uh, to whole plant-based. And one thing I really notice is the recovery. Sometimes, you know, I've done too much in the gym or, or running and, you know, during the day or during the evening, you think, oh, I'm a bit sore this evening. But then the next morning, uh, quick recovery, regenerated. And I put some of that down to the, uh, you know, anti-inflammatory sort of, um, um, protective um, effects of whole foods plant-based. Nice. I love what you said that if you exercise every day, there's no decision making. It's so true. If I miss one day because every now and then I have a very early appointment and then you know have to get to work, then it's harder the next day to do it. <laughs> Someone once said to Jenny, it said, oh, you're so good getting up early in the morning and going swimming in gym. And, and it, so she said, well, Oh, it's just what I do. I mean, in my case, I just have clothes set out the night before. And and uh, by the time I come to my senses in the morning, I realise I've already got my going to swimming clothes on or my going running clothes on. And it's like, oh, well, OK, uh, even if I feel tired, it's like, oh, I don't have to go flat out if I feel tired. But often once you get going, you actually realise that you actually feel quite good. Right. What I do sometimes is I trick myself. I say, look, I only have to get on my spin bike for five minutes and then that's it. And then once I'm on, I got my clothes and my shoes and I'm like, all right, I'm already here. Right. You know, I use the same strategy. Jenny's keener on swimming than I am. So we usually, when we're not on lockdown, do a couple of swim squads each week. And, uh, you know, I find swimming a bit hard. And, and if I'm feeling not keen, I just say to myself, no, 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 Malcolm, you don't have to go too hard. You can just hang in there at the back of the group, just plod along, it'll be all right. And then you get there and you think, why did I just swim that 200 metre set so hard? That's funny. So Brenda, who's watching live says, do you have any suggestions for trying to start a whole food plant-based diet with diverticulitis? Um, I would say that the evidence doesn't support the idea that you have to avoid, um, you know, seeds and little bits and food. Um, if you've got gut symptoms, you know, and you, you, you get, you know, crampy abdominal pain, for example, you might want to be a little bit cautious starting it. You know, like, like you might want to start with more potatoes and brown rice and, and not immediately dive into a huge amount of legumes or, or other sort of gas producing food. Um, on my website, in the uh, gut health section, I've actually written um, uh, a guide to restoring gut health, which is sort of like a one or two page guide for someone who's you know got abdominal symptoms and a sensitive gut and trying to transition to a whole plant based on we start with you know can sometimes generate a bit more bulk and gas and cause some symptoms. Um, and and uh, I, I can you're on the right track with doing whole foods plant-based because the evidence goes back decades that eating uh, um, more plant-based, more fiber, um, uh, usually um, 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 settles down uh, diverticular disease. Yeah. I just posted the link to your website where they can find the article that you were just talking about. And Joseph says, where can, can you order online plant-based meals in Melbourne Southeast? I live in Roeville 3178. 
Um, there, there are some, there's some services that have quite recently popped up that uh, provide um, plant-based meals services like that in Australia. Um, you'd have to look at them carefully because they're not all they're not all totally whole foods plant-based. You'll find that some are still using oil, for example. Yep. Have you been able to influence any of your colleagues to consider plant-based nutrition either for themselves or their patients? And is it harder to convince a colleague or a patient? Um, I, I don't think I've influenced many colleagues. I, I mean, I, I, it's, definitely a handful I have influenced. Um, no, I have, I don't think I've influenced a lot, but I've, I've become involved in, you know, organizations like Doctors for Nutrition and we're trying to just, we've got, we're developing a project to try and reach out to doctors and to give them like a toolkit and education classes and resources to back that up for their patients to uh, empower or educate those um, uh, other family physicians in Australia so that they have um, a little bit of knowledge and some material so that they can support their patients. And we think that we'll reach out to a few like that. Uh, I'm involved um, uh, in the um, Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. And I hope that I've influenced a few people through that organization. That's terrific. I think I've also acted, um, uh, I think I've also had uh, a few younger doctors and um, I think I've acted as a role model and, and sort of maybe not put the, the person onto whole foods plant-based, but them having found it have then come to me as a role model. And there's been several younger doctors in Australia and a few medical students that I've sort of um, done my best to sort of provide support and encouragement and guidance to them as, as uh, on their journey. And, and, um, I do. If we weren't in lockdown, I'd be supervising some uh, medical students on, on at times in my practice. And uh, when I'm contacted by um, medical students or health sciences students, or if a group of them ask Jenny and I to give a talk, we always love to get in there and uh, influence, or we sometimes jokingly say corrupt, uh, young open minds to uh, um, to. Uh, uh, um, introduce them to the sort of uh, evidence behind whole foods, plant-based nutrition and, and the sort of practical aspects of it. Yeah. So what do your colleagues make of you? Do they call you the crazy vegan doctor? Um, yeah, interestingly, you know, you know, when you work with someone who doesn't really understand what you do and have, or understand it or not really interested in it, and it's like, you know, and they might say to you things like, you know, we are omnivores, you know, uh, um, yeah, I've had a little bit of flack, you know, um, you know, in a practice where, where um, you know, the senior doctor sort of, you know, taken me out and said, you know, you know, not all, it's great what you do, but, you know, not all the patients like what you do. Like, I had a patient who saw you for worried, worried about prostate cancer. You told him to stop dairy. I would have actually just given him the information that dairy is associated with prostate cancer. It, but it's sort of like... You know, it's sort of like if someone comes to me and they're worried about their lungs and they're a smoker, of course I'm going to say, you know, smoking is going to damage your lungs. And if they're worried about prostate cancer, of course I'm going to tell them the truth. Dairy foods are associated with this disease. You know, it's up to you whether you, you do with that information. And I even had an experience several years ago where I actually um, uh, um, sort of applied for a position at a large practice. And... I seemed very keen to start with. And then once their team had sort of the senior team had got together, they sort of like, um, no, we decided to get someone else who was more of a generalist. And so just occasionally, I think, you know, you can have doors slammed shut on you as a doctor and get some flack because uh, of the whole foods plant-based and it's often dismissed as a vegan. You know, it seems to be, I think that happens in the US as well, but it certainly happens in Australia that it's like, I once I posted in a doctor, doctor's social media group about Neil Barnard speaking in Australia at the Doctors for Nutrition conference. And some, some of the comments were like, isn't he that vegan doctor? It's sort of like, you know, one way to discredit someone is you just label them as you're just a vegan rather than you're an evidence-based lifestyle nutrition doctor who's um, presenting the facts as they seem to. 
Nice. Kate says, Dr. Malcolm helped me so much to heal from Ramsey Hunt syndrome and palsy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And Jill said she'd love to hear about how a whole food plant-based diet can help with preventing COVID. Yes. Now, um, I'm not the world's expert on COVID. Uh, and I respect COVID. This is a, a nasty virus. Some people in Australia are sort of minimising the, uh, the danger of this virus. In the US, you'd be more aware of its uh, impact. Um, but uh, um, I think there's a lot we can do with our nutrition and lifestyle to um, reduce our risk of having a bad outcome should we get COVID. You know, we know that many of the risk factors for bad outcomes are things like obesity, high blood pressure, um, diabetes, heart disease, many diseases that are actually more vascular diseases and inflammatory diseases than, like, than lung conditions like asthma. And we know that all those underlying mechanisms um, uh, behind you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease can change very rapidly with diet. And so I gave a presentation, a free webinar last Tuesday night when I spoke about um, the, the circumstantial evidence that we have that nutrition and lifestyle could be, would be expected to reduce our risk of a bad outcome. Um, so I think you'd find that on our website, um, probably under webinars as a link to that. Uh, it's, our first, it's my first ever YouTube video. Um, uh, which we put up on our, our first one up on our YouTube channel. So I would say, yes, th there's never been a better time to um, get a healthier gut microbiome, to regulate the immune system, you know, eat more whole legumes. There's never been a better time to smash in leafy green vegetables several times a day to enhance the effect of our endothelium. And um, even if you already have chronic disease, some of the underlying mechanisms, which are probably what puts you at risk of bad COVID outcomes, can change very rapidly. That's great. You have a lot of fans watching. Brian says, great to connect and hear from you. Our five-year-old is your greatest advocate after our retreat teaching the children and adults at kindergarten. And Clark says, it was Dr. Malcolm Mackay and his wife Jenny's seminar that first inspired me to start a whole food plant-based SOS-free diet. Got a lot of fans. Yeah, and um, you know, this is what keeps us going. You know, the uh, the uh, um, um, positive effects we can have on people's lives. You know, and doing stories like that is sort of what keeps Jenny and I going on our on our mission. Any plans to write a book? Um, no, no, I, I've thought about that before. It's a lot of work. As soon as it's published, it's out of date. I, I'm already often, you know, perfectionist and ashamed of many sections on my website that seriously need rewriting and, and updating as I learn more and, and uh, get better at sort of communicating the nuances of plant-based nutrition. So uh, I think I'd rather put a lot more work into um, into sort of uh, the online equivalent of a book of, uh, of continuing to work on uh, building and upgrading my website. That's great. Well, it's just been a pleasure getting to hear from you. I'm so uh, happy that Australia has a wonderful plant-based doctor. Are you the only one? No, I I'm not the only one. Um, there's surprisingly few of us. Um, no, on our website, um, we have a list of um, health practitioners. And when we find out about uh, other doctors, the health practitioners who are both knowledgeable and supportive of a whole foods plant-based diet and available for consultation, um, we'll add them to our practitioners list on, on our website. That's great. That is great. Well, thank you so much. Do you have to go to work today? Because I know it's like seven o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning by you. No, it's um, Saturday morning today, and I usually don't work on a Saturday morning. That's right. You're the day. You're the you're down under and day later. Yeah. So I can tell you, um, with the news and everything in the world, that everything was all right overnight on Friday night, and everything Saturday morning, and everything's okay in the world. Do you um you know who's watching? Do you know Chef Anya Cass? She's from Australia, and she's watching the broadcast. Oh, hi, Anja. We've met Anja before. Yep, and, and her book and her material, her videos, I think she, she has a whole lot of uh, little short cooking videos. They're certainly listed on our website. 
That's fantastic. And do you know Spudfit Taylor, Andrew? Uh, Spudfit Taylor. I was Andrew's um, uh, doctor for his year of potato, of his Batoni diet for the year of 2016. And Andrew does some great work. And I actually learned quite a lot from supervising Andrew and from the sort of wisdom that came out of his year of potatoes and uh, beating food addiction. Well, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that there, there, that this is, this is fantastic. You were like the doctor behind this great experiment. Uh, I'll credit Andrew with the whole experiment. Uh, I was just a sort of supervisor and uh, um, I didn't really understand his the whole uh, potato only diet and food as uh, for food addiction approach at the start and said, Andrew why don't you just eat a few berries and a bit of spinach and a bit of this <clears throat> when I finally understood what he was doing uh, I just have said well look we've looked at the nutrition profile of potatoes because Jenny already had a spreadsheet on them before you came to see me and why don't you add in a little bit of sweet potatoes to help balance out the nutrition better? So that, that was my contribution to uh, um, tweaking his potato diet. Well, Apple's saying you were the potato doctor. You know how Dr. Goldhammer supervised water fasts. Maybe you can start supervising potato only fasts. I'm quite happy. And, and as I said at the time, you know, is a potato diet dangerous? You know, is to eat only potatoes, say for a month? And it's no. Dangerous would be, um, you know, drinking high protein uh, meal replacement powders. That would be danger. Potatoes would be a safe way to go. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your work and for taking the time to be on my show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, AJ. It's been an honor to be on your show uh, among the other giants that... that, uh, that well, we, we had one of your heroes just the other day, Dr. McDougall. So... You're in very, very good company. And, and please come on again. And guys, thank you so much for watching. And please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time when we have a chef who has been on before that you've asked to come back. She's going to be demonstrating how to make homemade SOS free hot sauces. That's Chef Kelly Williamson. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Mackay. Uh, goodbye. Take care.